All right, so we're here with um, Kyle Schutz from Stratton. First off, Kyle, am I saying your last name right? Yeah, Schutz, good. Okay. Whatever you want. <laughs> so obviously you speak English, but uh, I know you speak other languages. Around the house, do you speak German or French or, you know, what, what are you talking there? It's, it's mostly German. Okay. So I live in, in the German, yeah, I live in the German speaking part of Switzerland. So around 70% of, of, of Switzerland, they speak German. Okay. And about 20% French and 10% Italian. And then like 0.5%, the fourth language is uh, Romansh. Romansh. It's like a, yeah, it's like a, it's a, it's a mixture of all of them together. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, this is actually the, only the second time you and I have ever spoken. It's the first time we've done a video call, but we've traded emails yeah. and messages a number of times. So we've been friends, what, I guess two or three years now? Yeah, just, just around uh, two and a half, three years. Yeah. Yeah. I think mean, the last time I spoke, I called you from China. <laughs> but the other day you were in China? No, no, no. The last time we spoke, I, I, I called you from China. So I don't remember I, that. When was that? I, I needed uh, I needed some feedback from you regarding some bezel um, sort of questions oh, right. that I had. I remember and, that. Uh, yeah, that was a few years ago, I think, or a couple. Yeah, years ago. I, I called you from my hotel room. <laughs> yeah, I, I do remember that now. So, um, for those who don't know, you run uh, Stratton Watch Company, which is vintage racing inspired chronographs for the most part. I know you recently started selling uh, like a triple date or a GMT or both. And uh, yeah, not, not selling yet, but uh, de designed it and it's in the prototype stage. So hopefully launching that later this year. Okay. And then I don't want to, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do I remember you had, you were talking about launching a second brand. Is that still on the table or you want to talk it's, about that? It's, it's still on the table. Um, I've, I've designed a, a few watches. It's just I've been so preoccupied with um, Stratton. Um, I, I've also sort of reached a point, there's a typical three-year stage that an entrepreneur reaches in his business where um, it sort of reaches like a, a plateau. I know. And it, it, it gets quite lonely. Uh, so I, I'm Is really at that. Lonely or lonely? Lonely. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a long, hard road and, but you know, I've, I'm, I'm sort of making the, I, I feel I'm making the right decisions to, uh, to keep me going. I mean, I, I have no interest in, in, in stopping what I'm doing or, um, I, I wanted to develop and grow, but I, I think right now I'm, I'm in that position where I feel that. I can carry on going the way I am right now, you know, launching a few watches every year and, and staying the size I am. Um, or I can go the route of taking on an investor, not a silent investor, but someone who can get someone involved in the business and, and, and help and, and, and coach as well. Um, Cause there's only so much I can do and, and I might not see things the way other people see it something that i'm missing maybe so, so let's, let's dig into that last we spoke uh, a couple of years ago about this you I, I know you had sort of a you know kind of a high-powered career i think you worked in logistics and you were doing this sort of in the evenings and on weekends in your spare time is that still where you are right now still where i am L luckily my um my day job um I, I perform really well there so they they really allow me to do <clears throat> Um, to manage my time how I feel necessary. Um, so I'm, I'm very lucky in that sense that, that my day job gives me that freedom. Um, so I know as long as I perform there, you know, I, I can manage my time really well um, because I have a wife and three kids at the same time. I know. Um, it, it's, and you have a racing habit. And I have, yeah, a lot of hobbies. Get to that. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it's, it's juggling everything together and it, 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 it's working really well. It's, it's, it's just, I feel that if I want, I know Stratton has uh, potential as, as well as many other fellow micro brands do. And in order to do that, 
I feel that I would need to take the step of 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 um, going the investor route. Um, I, I've spoken with a few other brands who have gone that route from the get go, and they wouldn't have changed. Uh, you know the the route they went. Um, I, I think I'm I'm investigating it at at, at the moment to 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 see what what happens. In 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 the beginning, I would say. Even the first two years, I got many offers to to take on investment, but I always turned it down because I just it's not about the money you, you need to have the right type of person on board they need to um, you know it, it needs to be a a good fit yeah you know and, and so, so yeah you you work from home correct <clears throat> I work from home yeah so yeah. Part of my backstory is um, I started my company when I actually lost a job, but then probably like four or five, not maybe six months later, I ended up getting another job, but I was still working from home. And I just found it, it, it was right before we finished production on my first model. So at that point, I was already working on the second and third model. And I was pr managing production on our first model. Then we got the first model in. There was a lot of QC issues we had to deal with. We had to do order fulfillment. And yep. I was learning as I was going and still trying to dedicate myself eight hours a day to my full-time job. And it was just yep. too much for me. So, you know, I, I guess my question is, if you have, even if you're working from home and you've got that flexibility in your schedule, don't you find that it's just there aren't enough hours in the day? How many hours a day are you dedicating to your business versus your job? Do you, do you find it hard to maintain the right balance? For me, um, I think it's solely down to the uniqueness of my position of my full-time job. Uh, really, I, I, I don't need to put in as much time to get the results that I need if I put in that time with, with Stratton. Right. So it's, 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 I'm lucky in that sense that I have more than enough time during the day uh, to, to manage everything. That's great. Uh, to, to keep my employer happy. I actually just had my, my performance talk yesterday uh, with my, my full-time job and everything was... Uh, they're happy. Yeah, yeah they're, they're 100% happy. I had a job and, uh, 12, like a dozen years ago where, you know, like I, I didn't really have to work that hard and it was good money and my boss left me alone and I had, you know, sort of, you know, free reign to do whatever I wanted to. And yeah. um, I remember at one point, I literally spent the entire summer just kind of like putzing around on the internet because I had nothing to do. Like the phone rang, yep. I picked it up, take an order, then, you know, go back to whatever. And I wish I would, I could go back and start this business then with yeah. the salary, the benefits, the, you know, the staff. I had, you know, two yep. assistants and uh, I just, I squandered the time. And then later on it was like, wow, I, you know, I really wish I had that time back. So that's time. Great yeah, yeah. That position. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how long have you been, how long, when did Stratton start? Stratton started in the early 2015. Okay. So now it's um, 2019. So you're just coming up or you just passed your four year anniversary somewhere around there. Yeah. It'll, uh, I can say officially it'll be four years in August. So you took your first sale in August? Uh, that was when the Kickstarter ended on my first. Uh, that's when, you know, it was set in stone that Stratton is successful, created. The first model's going to production. So I take it as the 1st of August. That's All right, when so my, my campaign ended, yeah. I think a lot of people are interested in the background of microbrand owners. How do we get into this? So I know a little bit sure. about you. I know, obviously, you've got you know, a full-time career, you've got a wife and three kids. I know that you also are into vintage racing Alfa Romeos. Um, yep. So you have that kind of as a habit or a hobby. How did you go, you know what, I'm not going to go into the racing business. I'm, I'm going to start a watch company. How, how did you get that idea? And what, what's your background or how did you decide I'm going to do this? Um, I had when I, I moved to Switzerland in 2010 from Cape Town, South Africa. Do you um, speak Dutch too? Uh, my, my father's side is Dutch. Okay. So I can understand. We, 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 they speak Afrikaans, in, in, okay. which is similar to, to Dutch. But um, basically for family reasons, my, my eldest son, who is now 11, 
he left South Africa with his mom and moved to Switzerland. And uh, I couldn't bear to live without him. So um, I, I left my family business in, in, in Cape Town, um, house, cars, everything, packed everything up. Um, and I literally, I moved to Switzerland with $2,000 in my pocket. Wow. Um, I have no university degree, although I did a, a, um, a business management certificate after school. Um, I was never really the study type. I didn't want to go into, into university. So um, I started off uh, with the technical knowledge I learned in my dad's business. Um, it was awnings and, and, and sun covers for, for, for hotels and that. And I became a, a technician here in Switzerland, but it, it's probably one of the hardest jobs I ever did going to a building site in the rain, hail or snow. Um, and I did that on the side until I found an English sales job. And then throughout that time, uh, I was looking for business ideas. Uh, I wanted to start something on my own. Um, I loved watches already before then. Uh, and I started a business where I would buy unknown brands from, you know, I had one supply in Germany, uh, another in, in Holland. I, I would buy the watches. I started like off very or new production? No, no, just new, new okay. unknown brands. I, I wouldn't really call them micro brands. They were sort of like those mushroom type of brands, you know? Um, Wait, you so weren't the I guy said, behind Aromatic and... Uh, no, uh, that, that's, the, that's the Dutch... That's the Dutch company. Um, okay. I, I, I did buy in some of their watches. Yeah. But basically, I, 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 bought, I started off with about 10, and I sent them to South Africa to, to my mom. And uh, there's like the South African version of eBay. Mm -hmm. And I put them on there from, from Switzerland, did all the, the, the layout and everything. And as soon as a sale came through, my mom would uh, pack the watch and send it via post. And within a very short space of time, I built up an extremely profitable business. I would say I was doing about 250 watches a month. That's phenomenal. It was, it, it took off in a big way, but after well, two well, years. It was mostly in South Africa though? That's where all your customers yeah, all, were? All South Africa. All, wow. Even though I was based in Switzerland, I basically was doing the, the finances and the paying and, and uh, putting up the, <laughs> the auctions on, on the site. So um, that is where I, I sort of got into the watch selling business. Um, but when I started, the rand was, that's a South African um, uh, currency, right. rand. Sure. It was six rand to one dollar when I started. I Two know where this later, is going. It ended up at 14. Right. So, so I lost. Begins, yeah. Exactly. So it didn't become profitable for me anymore. And I started that in 2012. And at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015, I stopped the business in South Africa, closed it, and I invested one and a half thousand dollars to get my first prototypes done for the vintage driver Krona. So I respected um, you before, but now I'm starting to build up a new admiration for you. So let me just recap. <laughs> you had a, you were, you didn't go to university. You yeah. were working in a family business, which most people think you know, family business, he's got, you know, dad's going to take care of you. You left, <laughs> you followed your wife and son to Switzerland with $2,000 in your pocket, worked your butt off doing this grinding job with the awnings and hotels and, you know, in the bad weather, you invested the money in this really risky watch startup in South Africa, got your mom while in Switzerland, working, <laughs> while you're in Switzerland, got your mom working for you. And then when things didn't go well, you, sh you folded up shop, started all over again with $1,500 and look at you now. Is that, is that kind of where we are so far? Exactly. That, wow. <laughs> I, I'm blown away. I didn't know all this about you. All right. So you, your stock is climbing. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so you started Stratton. Um, when, when did you get into the racing? Because so do you want to talk about I mean, I don't want to, again, I don't yep. want to embarrass you. But sure, sure. Do you yep, want to talk yep. about your, what you do with racing and the Alfa Romeos? Sure. My, my love for, for cars and racing started off very young. Um, my dad was a racing and rally driver in, in South Africa. Really? And Yeah. He, he, but he, I mean, he, he wasn't on a professional level or sponsored in that. It was all self-funded. Well, he's like me. He's just an aggressive driver and tries to avoid <laughs> accidents. 
<laughs> well, I'm a rally driver. Am I, I'm not a rally driver. Anybody can say that. I'm not so, What does that mean? <laughs> um, basically, he was a driving instructor as well on, on, on track days. And um, he had a, an, an old Opal Cadet in the oh, 80s yeah, that, he, that he rallied. Um, and you know, I, I loved cars from a very young age. I was probably, that's probably, and still today is my biggest passion is, is, is cars and racing. And, uh, I could name like any car at like three, four years old. And, um, so th that's, and it's mostly Italian cars. My, my dad had Alphas and, and Lancias. Um, and you know, that, that bug sort of bit me and I, before I left South Africa, I, I owned uh, the, uh, the same type of car that helped me inspire my first watch, the vintage driver Krono, my uh, Alfetta GT. Um, I, I had this, way. the GT V6. Uh, not uh, before it became the GT V6. It was known as the Alfetta GT. Okay, uh, there's a, a really nice looking if, car. If you click on about us on my website and you scroll down down to the bottom, you'll you'll see a picture of it. And uh, I I had one of those in South Africa and I loved it. And when I left to move to Switzerland, I put it in a garage, and I worked my as I said I, I worked my ass off for for a year, and then I I bought myself the same car here. So is the, one, sold, is the one you had in South Africa still there in storage? I sold it. Okay. I sold it. But you didn't sell and, it. Until uh, you got the new one here in Switzerland. It, it, I, not exactly at the same time. I, I bought the, the the one in Switzerland, and then uh, after three years, I, I sold the one in, in South Africa because I I knew I wasn't going back. Got it. Uh, so it it didn't make sense. So in terms of racing, then um, you know I, I I had that car here in Switzerland that was sort of my how can I say you know I. There's nothing more I looked forward to than if the weather was nice and I'd come home from work and I'd get in the car and, and just drive. I used to ride motorcycles back in, in my army so, days. I had you know the feeling. The same way. It was a reason yeah. to get up early in the morning because nobody was on the road. And I, I yeah. hate getting up early, but it was like, I'm getting up early tomorrow morning, I'm going riding. And there's like 20 guys that I'm meeting at like, you know, the fast food joint down the street. We're all going to pull up at like 6 a.m. And we'll just go riding for two hours. Yep. Yeah. yeah it's, no, it's 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 the feeling is just it's complete i just love it it's just you and the road and, and the car and no radio just i roll down the windows even if it's freezing cold so i can hear the car so, and hear the motor and, this is one of the things i like about you and your brand is that you know racing themed watches are very common everybody's doing you know the, the tag or sort of monaco riff or whatever and um you know I guess for some people, maybe they're as passionate about it as you are, but it doesn't necessarily translate into the the way the brand is marketed or promoted or communicated to the public. Sure. But, um, you know, with you, it's like I've always said, you know, when I talk about Stratton, I'm like, this guy, he doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. He's out there on the track in his vintage Alfa Romeo, you know, ripping yep. it around the turns. So um, yep. I, I appreciate that you've always stayed true to that sort of theme with your brand. Sure. It, and it, I, I can attribute that solely to the success of Stratton, which has helped me uh, get onto the track, you know, as in literally going racing. And, and I, for the last two years, I, I've been doing a, a racing series called the RCN, which is the Rundstrecken Challenge. I'm not um, it's, that. it's a 15 laps of the Nordschleife. Oh, which is, 15 laps? 15 so laps. People yeah. that don't know racing, the Nordschleife is the northern loop of the, um, help me out, what's the track? Nürburgring. The Nürburgring. It's the northern loop yeah. of the Nürburgring. So that's actually one of the most challenging stretches of tarmac in the world. And how many people? Well, it is. There? Yeah, it's, it, it is the most dangerous and most difficult racetrack in the world. It's also the I mean, largest. It's the Widowmaker. I mean, people die there. Yeah, people die there, yeah. Um, you know, if you put into perspective, an average racetrack is between four and seven kilometers long. If I include the Nürburgring in, in the Nordschleife track, it's around 24 kilometers, right. one lap. So, so my, my, 
it, it was quite funny because I, I would drive up Friday afternoon, I would leave. Um, it would take me six hours to get to the track, driving on the German Autobahn at 200 kilometers an hour. And Which then, like uh, 20 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. I, I would then uh, hit, hit, the, hit the sack, go to sleep, wake up at seven in the morning, drive three hours, full blast. And uh, right, so afterwards, Nordschleife, how long is just the Nordschleife track you're doing? It's not the full tw track. Tw um, well, depends on the race. There are eight races per season, and two of them included the Formula One, the, the Nurburgring, as well. And you're doing so it, 15 it, laps? 15 laps, yeah. yeah. So that's three hours. So, yeah, it's about 320 Ks around, around there, somewhere, if I'm calculating correctly. So I literally drive that. <laughs> and then uh, get back in the car and drive six hours home. That's amazing. In, in the same <laughs> car you were just at, out on the track? No, 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 no. Okay, no, no. So you trailer yeah, the, the race car to the track. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, no, so my only racing experience, my son plays, uh, I have a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old, and they play Xbox, and we have the uh, whole Forza series on Xbox. Okay. And so I've got uh, like a hundred cars in my collection and you know, yeah, like <laughs> you know, three or four laps. That's the race. The North, the North life, one lap, that, the entire yeah. like eight minutes to do one lap. One lap. Yeah. 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 And I've got a bunch of Alfa Romeos. I got the GTV six. Um, yeah. So, um, nice. Yeah. So what, since you launched your business, you are producing and developing models at what seems like a breakneck pace, but, I've kind of figured out that it seems like you'll reveal something at least a year, it seems, before you're ready to put it up on Kickstarter. And do I have that about right? Are you, are you typically promoting something for six months to a year before you're ready to actually start taking people's money? Yeah, I think last year was a specifically difficult year for me because I, I really wanted to launch my, my current, the, the, the Gera and the, the Bullhead, the Standard and the Bullhead. Uh, the bullet I'm wearing right now. Um, I wanted to launch that already in September. Um, and I exposed that design or, or opened up that design to the public after my Speciale campaign ended in January. Right. So it, it's, it's, it's around the six month stage. Um, but because of the delay with the prototypes that weren't to the way that I wanted them, I made some changes myself as well. I had to delay the launch to, to February. So, but I, ideally I'm, I'm looking uh, to, to move this. This is officially my last Kickstarter that I'll ever do. Uh, really? For, so for, this, for is announcement. this is your last Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah. And is it up on, is it up on Kickstarter now? Yeah. It ends in, in three days on the 19th of March. All right, so by the time this airs, your, your Kickstarter will be done. And you're over goal, I take it. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sitting at around 870% of the goal. That's great. Um, it's the lowest performing of, of, of all my previous four, four campaigns. Do you but I think that's think down to, yeah, there's, there's a few reasons, I think. Um, firstly, I think I took very long to, it, it was basically a year just over a year from showing the design to launching a pre-order and it's basically a year and a half until people get the watches right right in in august that's when deliveries planned this year and that that's a long time um you think people just lost enthusiasm as you were waiting to get the prototype yeah corrected yeah yeah and secondly i think the the amount of successful campaigns right now i mean you've got ross at tam tam you got um zelos that also just launched uh, Zeric also have a campaign for yeah, one and of these guys are like they're really good at kickstarter and i've always thought you were yeah. really good but the competition is coming up yeah it's coming up and i just think you know my my watches are really niche you know I, I've, I've got a lot of loyal customers uh who buy sort of every watch yeah but um i you know, if, if we have a look to see what's mostly wildly successful, it's dive watches, right? I mean, right. it's just such a popular category. Too. Yeah, chronographs are. I, I just think that, that the divers are on another level. But, you know, for sure, we, 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 we can look at 
kickstart and I think uh, I, I specifically said, you know, the, this is going to be my last kickstart. I had some feedback from customers saying, you know, Carl, maybe you should move away from kickstart. And I, I agree. And Why I, did, I they give you this, did they give you reasons? I think, you know, personally, I knew it even before there, there's that negative relation to Kickstarter brands and specifically in the watch industry. And I, I, some people could, yeah, some people do brand me as a Kickstarter brand. I mean, look, I also, I've never put down Kickstarter. Kickstarter is not the problem. It's just the outlook of, of, of the watch industry on Kickstarter brands. Right. I've always been a, a, a very diehard supporter of Kickstarter. And specifically, I've always said for, for one reason, I've used it for one reason only. And that is for the ease of its platform. You know, after my first campaign, I, I did everything on my own. I didn't use Backer Kit or any of those other services. I used, I used the Kickstarter surveys. I used the updates. I used the messaging service. I had everything just worked out well. Yeah, you know, it was a, well, a really nice looking machine. I, I always thought you had a great system in place and you were killing yeah, it. Yeah. And it, it, it is, it, it's, it's, it's a great platform simply because it's, it's open. Backers can, can talk to each other. I think Russ is struggling a bit at the moment with his campaign because he's got like over a thousand comments. You mean just because it's, it's hard to keep up with it all? Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine what, what he must, you know, specifically in these type of projects. And I, I think, um, you know, people become then watch designers themselves and use the comment section to try and change designs. And this is where I urge specifically new people to kickstart. If they find themselves in that situation, don't do everything to please everyone. You just can't right. no, do I, what, what I you that. set out to do. Yeah. And uh, put your foot down. You know, that that's it. You, you people yeah. buy the design. If, one says, yeah, we should have a vote to change this or to change that. It, it can get messy. And that's found, when problems occur. Yeah, I found that with Kickstarter, every project we did wasn't quite as successful as the one right before it. And okay. I, 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 part of that was with each project, see, I wasn't doing what you were doing. I wasn't using Kickstarter past the project to do anything. I would say to all my backers, okay, here's a coupon code go through the website and buy it through the website, but you're not going to give me any money because you've already paid through Kickstarter. And I was capturing all the customer data through my website. And then when we came out with the next model, I would do pre-orders first and then I would yep. launch on Kickstarter. So I was converting okay. a lot of Kickstarter backers to customers. And yep. so we were seeing lower and lower balances. And I, it wasn't like I was thinking that I don't want to be on Kickstarter forever. I mean, I did think that, but that wasn't why I was doing it. But it became clear to me after a while that Kickstarter is great for exposure. It's great in, in, in that it sort of forces some discipline on the project creator in some ways, but by yeah. like the third or fourth project, I realized it just wasn't a good fit for my business. The, yeah. the, the project window 30 to 60 days wasn't right. The, you know, expectations on the part of backers started to get, you know, sort of unrealistic it was hard for me to keep up with the communications and I just felt like, you know, what you're talking about with Ross, like it was really difficult for me sometimes to just be polite in the responses yeah. to everybody who says, well, I'd like it better if you did this or did that. I'm like, we're already in prototyping. The design, the design is set. I'm not changing. Set, yeah. I got to yeah. get this product to market. We spent six months working on it just to get here. I'm not going back to the drawing board. Yeah. And I just felt after a while, I'm like, I, you know, I don't want to be on Kickstarter anymore. But it was also because of what you're saying, where people do unfortunately look down on brands that are on Kickstarter forever, or, you know, just on Kickstarter period. I think it's much yeah. different now than it was back in 2013, 2014, when I first started there. The yeah. attitude was backers were trying to help entrepreneurs launch their companies and bring good products to market. And now it's kind of turned into almost like Amazon or eBay, where people are just looking to buy product at a discount. There's not yeah. as much sort of, I don't know, like grassroots goodwill. It, it's no longer crowdfunding. It's more like, it's just a, it's a mid, Middle East bazaar, you know, of product. Yeah. 
Um, and also I've noticed that the gap seems to be widening where the companies that are doing really well are the ones that are promoting for six months, paying for advertising, lots of great video and, and images, and it's really a slick project. Yeah. I wasn't doing that five, six years ago. I was just going like, you know, here's pictures, here's the drawing, here's the video. We shot it ourselves. We throw it up there. And I was happy to get, you know, a hundred backers, $40,000. Now it's like, yeah, you're not successful on Kickstarter unless you've got 800% of goal and you're a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and I'm, and I'm like, well, the numbers don't add up all the time anymore. Yeah. Um, so the bullhead, the Ligera is what's up there now. Yeah. Do, do you, so I, I've seen that you've got this internal bezel model. It's like a GMT. And then you've got one I think is like a triple date. Is that the next model? That's the next model. Um, what I've decided to do now is, is usually the, the process was when, it, when a Kickstarter ended, I would do the calculations of how many watches were ordered. And then whatever profit was left over, I would um, increase the quantity to continue selling on my website. Uh, but what I've decided to do with this model is I'll literally be taking pre-orders for this because uh, payment usually takes Kickstarter two weeks after the project ends, after all the information's done, maybe three weeks, four weeks after the project. So I'm looking at mid-April. I've said 15th of April will be the cutoff for any orders. After that, I will not be taking any more orders for that watch. I'm not producing so you're not more. From inventory, you're not going to make more. You're just, no. Whatever, whatever it gets sold in pre-order, that's what you're making. Exactly. And I'm investing the profits into, um, I think if I go back to my very first watch, I look at that as basically a, a staple product of my business that was selling consistently every day on my website. And one of the reasons I think why was it was more affordable. It, it costs on my website $369. I, I look at the success of other sort of brands that came up after me as well, like um, Dan Henry, which came up, uh, I think it was in 2016, I think Dan Henry launched. Something like um, that. Yeah. Um, and that sort of price category, 250, 300. Uh, I think from, from my product category, I'm still selling my first watch. I've, I've ordered it two, three times over. Wow. Um, but that's a quartz chronograph though, right? That's the mega quartz chronograph. Yeah. Um, so I've decided to invest the profits and I'm doing two more variations of the driver series. Which was so your first model. The, yeah. Um, it's going to be the daily driver and the classic driver. The daily driver is um, a 44 millimeter, same case as the, the vintage driver, but it's got like nine different color variations, some with sort of striped racing dials. Okay, so this is the one I've seen you posting recently with the racing yeah. stripes down the dial. I didn't realize yeah. that was the same case. Yeah, it's, it's the same case as, as, the, as the first um, Does as it the have first watch. Does the neural bezel? Like the, it uh, doesn't have that. It's got a, a standard bezel. Okay, that's so why I didn't not recognize moving. that's the same case. Yeah. 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 All right. So why. let me just see if I understand this now. So the plan is you're going to keep producing that first model, which is sort of like the anchor, the staple in your product range. And you're not going to do pre-orders. You're just going to make them and then sell them from inventory. Well, yes, I, I, I have been. Yeah. Over the years. You I have, have been, been ordering more. Yeah. Yeah. I've right. ordered it. I've but you're not going to do pre-orders of those. You're just going to sell them. You're just going to make them no. and sell them. But then make them and sell them. Yeah. But then these other models, you're going to do pre-orders, but then that's it. Like they're just going to sell from pre-order. And if, if you fought, if you make 500, that's all you've sold. You're not going to make more. No. Uh, what I'm doing is, is I'm, I'm investing the profits from the Laguerra and the bullhead and purchasing outright 500 pieces of the daily driver, the 44 millimeter and purchasing 500 pieces outright of the classic driver, which is a 40 millimeter. Right, I got that. Um, but what about the other model I've seen you, the, the one with the internal bezel and the GMT? The, the, yeah, that's the Tura and the, the, the Tura triple calendar and the Tura GMT. Those are in prototype stage. Um, depending on the success of the daily and the classic, I will either 
again purchase outright uh, and produce 500 of each. Um, or I will do a short pre-order. I'll start production in some way or form so that I can get the timeline shrinked from right. six months to right down. So basically the, the, the classic driver and the daily driver are, I'm sort of aimed at a daily beta. So right. it's 20 ATM, screw down crown, double gasket pushes. So it's good for swimming. It's got sapphire crystal. Um, they all come with um, stainless steel bracelets. So that's something which I haven't done before. So standard on a bracelet. Do you have the price um, set for that yet? Yeah, the, the retail price will be two ninety nine. Really? Yeah, two wow. ninety nine. And, and it's still most back and right? No, this I'm going to do the Miyota 6S21. Okay, so it's the, just pure the, quartz. Yeah, the reason why I've gone the Miyota 6S21 is it's a dual register uh, chronograph. So if I use the Mecha Quartz version, it would be the VK64. Right. Many people don't like that movement because it doesn't have a running second hands. Unless second you have hand, the, one, the, tri, the tri compacts, right. Unless I have the tri compacts, exactly. But for, the, for those two watches, I, I want a dual register. I don't want a triple register. No, I get it. That, that's a clean look. And the 6S21 Miyota Quartz is, is, is a fantastic movement on its own. Oh, it's very reliable. Yeah. Um, it's also got that um, multiple tick per second uh, uh, chronograph uh, second. Oh, it doesn't have the snapback. It doesn't have the snapback reset like the Mecha Quartz, but it right. moves at a, a, a multiple ticks per second. It's, it's not your typical uh, Quartz tick. Yeah, that's cool. Um, on, yeah, so, you know, I'll, I'll probably start off, I, I've ordered them already. So they're going to be done uh, at the end of June, 1,000 pieces, 500 of each. And I'll probably launch a short pre-order, like two, three weeks before delivery, before they're done. Um, I already have the prototypes by then. They're ready in about 35 days. So I've, because it's, the, it's such a simpler watch, my designs have been so complex before uh, that my manufacturer really needs time to um, develop them and produce them. Which Whereas is why with you have these, the prototypes and you have to go and fix what's, what's wrong. I've been there. Exactly. Yeah. And I think with, with this, I'm just taking my knowledge and I'm using some cases that I've used in the past. The only new case out of the two is the classic driver, the 40, 40 millimeter one, which is a completely new case, um, but it's very similar. Okay, yeah, we lost you on video for a second. So just so I'm yeah. clear, you have two case sizes for this new model, 40 and 44? Yeah. All right, so that should please everybody. Yeah, sure. And that, I've always tried to do that, launch, launch two case sizes to, to cover the, the market because I just dislike seeing those comments like, Oh. Um, it, it, it's too big or it doesn't fit me or it's too small or, you know, make a bigger one. You know, we, we always have that. So, and I've, yeah. I've already, when I've posted the 44 millimeter one, somebody says, oh, I wish you made it in 40. And then I said, well, I am making it, but it's called the My classic drop. driver. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, looking forward to that, seeing, seeing what happens. And well, people don't realize you know, the, when they say that, like you have to make, when you make a totally different case size, even a different case material, same design, it's a whole new minimum order quantity. So if you have to make 500 yeah. of one size, you got to make 500 of the other. So it's a yeah. tremendous amount of investment, especially if you're not doing pre-orders, you're just ordering them before you've, yeah. had, you've even sold a single piece. That's a tremendous yeah. amount of investment on your part. So, you know, like yeah, I it's a risk. understand it's a like risk. how much risk you're taking there. Yeah, no, it de definitely is uh, uh, a risk. Um, but I, I firmly believe that, you know, I'll, I'll look at a short pre-order and put them up at 275 each. That is, that is the plan. Um, and have a very short pre of three weeks, let the people order. And because I know that'll be another staple seller, uh, you know, yeah, no, people I, I will agree. buy it. So um, can we talk a bit about, um, I don't know if this is something you want to talk about, but when you were doing the Mecha Quartz chronographs, I'm pretty sure you were going to the factory to do QC, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you want to talk um, about that? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I can say there's a lot of misconception, misconception of, of, I'm based in Switzerland, but, you know, my watches aren't made here. Um, 
and my watches are i can honestly say proudly made in china as many things are and a lot of us know that uh, even the swiss watches are mostly made in yeah. china exactly exactly we all know the truth the guys who really know what's going on um and i, I don't want to take anything away from from that you know um so i've always been a very hands-on approach to the way I deal with things in, in, in Stratton. And that meant that after a production is finished, I, I physically fly to, to China um, and I QC and pack each and every watch myself. So and you can film it from China. Exactly. Right. So basically what I do is I, I fly there. Um, I arrive the next day, I get up and I work basically 20 hour days for seven days. Uh, I, I check and I pack and I put the number on it and I put it in a box and once the boxes are filled, my uh, fulfillment guy comes, picks up the boxes and, and does the whole um, shipping process for me. And so you, the, the way I found out that you were doing this was I, I think I was asking you about the, um, the flyback reset on the Mecca Quartz. I know sometimes yeah. because of the torque or the inertia, the second exactly. hand goes past the zero yeah. And you know, like the, the, the tolerances on the second hand post and the friction that holds the, the second hand on there isn't enough to keep it. So do you mind sharing like, you know, what sort of rate you found of, you know, this has to be reassembled because it's just not tight enough or, you know, how, I've, like what's your experience with that movement? I've had fantastic experience. Honestly, it's, it's literally all down to the hand that's used, the chronograph seconds hand. The, the, the counterbalance, weight, the, the weight, hand. exactly. Um, I have produced maybe, if I can take an estimate, probably around four and a half to five thousand watches with the Mecha Quartz movement, either VK sixty three, VK sixty seven, or VK sixty four. But all flyback and chrono reset. All all flyback chrono reset, and I can count on my two hands how many times I've had that problem. But are you, are you talking about after you send it to the customer or are we talking about before you, you ship from China, you find these pieces in QC and you send them back for reassembly? I can, let's call it after the customer's received it. Okay, so the Ten. very small number after the customer gets yeah. them. But yeah. mostly because that's your, you're checking them and having them reassembled if need be before you ship. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But I've heard that, like what you said about, it's really, my, my factories told me the same thing when I asked. It's really about making sure you understand the, the physics of the seconds hand weight and length. If it's yeah. too long, it's too heavy, right past zero. And people don't understand, like they think, well, why can't it just be reset like a quartz, you know, it doesn't work that way. It's a yeah. mechanical problem, not a, an electronic exactly. problem. Yeah. It needs to go, it needs to go back and, and, and be, be reset manually. I remember when you um, told me you were flying to China to do your QC. I thought that I'm like, how? Well, that that's nuts. I've never. Then, <laughs> so, I was in Hong Kong for the show last year, and we did this big dinner uh, for micro brand owners. We had like 30 micro brand owners there, and uh, I ended up talking with John Mack from Trasca, and he told me yes. he's like, yeah, I'm sleeping at my factory right now. Literally, he's got like a cot <laughs> on the. <laughs> doing QC and he's like, I'm like what are you homeless he goes no 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 I'm not homeless I'm just I'm doing QC and I'm sleeping <laughs> so yeah, I guess he didn't I, want to go, like leave the factory and go to a hotel whatever I, so I can understand because <laughs> I can understand that because I as I said I was literally doing 20 hour days and uh, I wasn't going to sleep on the floor but you know I, I traveled I back to the hotel time. but <laughs> it's loud as hell people don't realize like these factories so I was in China last May, um, almost a year ago, to, I wanted to get like a deeper understanding of the process. When I send them a, a design, what happens from there? Why is it that we get prototypes back and they're not quite right? You know, where do the quality issues come from? I wanted to understand like, you know, why does it take this, long, this length of time to make a dial, make a case, whatever, how many, yeah. you know, processes are involved? So, um, we were going over to Shenzhen from Hong Kong every day. We weren't staying in Shenzhen and it's like, it's two hours and it's right across the water, but it's, you know, the border crossing is a nightmare. 
So, you know, we didn't even get started touring any of these places until lunchtime. And then you go to a factory and of course you got to do the tea ceremony for half an hour before they'll yeah. show you anything. And we're burning daylight. So, um, like th we're pulling up to this, we're, we're traveling across Shenzhen. It's a huge, people don't realize, it's huge. It's huge, yeah. It's enormous. It's the, the land. I think 20 million people, I think. Huge. If I'm not just, it's, it's or more. It must be. It would take you like two hours to go from one side to the other. So I'm like, you know, we, uh, we're in one factory and I'm like, we still got another place to visit today. And it's like coming up on four o'clock. Like, you know, we, we got to get going here. And the guy goes, don't worry about it. My, my tour, my tour guide, he goes, don't worry about it. We're going to go to the next place, grab the factory owner. We know this guy, we're friends with him. We're going to go out to dinner and then we'll go back and tour the factory. I'm like, I don't want to tour the factory at night. Like, no, what's going on there? And he goes, no, it's second shift. Like some of these yeah. guys run shifts around the clock. So they really work there. hard. It's got to be like, you know, ignore, you know, incredibly noisy. Yeah. No, the, the, the Chinese work ethic is insane. I mean, they, they, they literally, it's just in their culture. They, they, they work like crazy. I mean, yeah. you know, with my manufacturer, I, I got really lucky in finding the right one for me. Right. Uh, from the get-go. From you the get-go. Working with the same factory you started with? Exactly. That's great. Because I'm on like and, my fourth factory now. <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I always give the, this advice and I've, I've given it to, to many up and coming um, sort of brand owners. Uh, I always say you, you're going to have problems with every single manufacturer, even Swiss manufacturers. Oh, forget it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's to me, it's down to how things are handled when issues arise. Yep. If a factory is reluctant to rectify their problems, that's not someone you want to work with. Uh, and secondly, it's down to communication. How fast yeah. are they responding um, and how they treat you? And I can say from, from, from my, my side, my feedback is, I literally could say I hit the jackpot from the get-go because no, no email goes unanswered for a few hours, even if it's over the night. And I've got one lady that's responsible for me. Um, that's great. She's fantastic. You know, I'm, when I go there, I, I spent, when was it, 2017, I spent my, my um, birthday there while QCing. And uh, karaoke is big in China. I know. And, and we, the, the party was at the karaoke. And, uh, you know, it's become like a, like a family. They, they, did they, you sing? Like, yeah, I sing. Well, do you know sing you remember well. the song you did? I did lots, but uh, one, I sang a lot of Frank Sinatra. You sang a lot of Frank Sinatra? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I, we're going to do karaoke together. So, um, <laughs> but you don't, you don't typically go to the Hong Kong show in September, do you? No, um, I'll, I'll probably be there in August uh, in, in Shenzhen. Uh, for the QC and delivery of of the Legere and the Bullhead models, but it's I've always missed that show. And but you, you know, I've got Basel World. No, I've got Basel World next week. I'm going to oh, be you exhibiting. Are going to Basel. Yeah, I'm going to be exhibiting at the Hyperion in the lobby. Okay. Um, yeah, is that the Swiss Lab? Uh, no, the Swiss Creative Lab is 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 in Basel World. So you're doing That's, that same thing with James Henderson, right? Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Um, I'm going to try that out. Yeah, um, it's pretty informal. It's in the, the the lobby of the hotel near the bar, restaurant. So there's ten brands, and we're sharing around six tables or five tables or something like that, a bit more. All right. So um, let me just kind of fill people in here. So Basel World, everybody knows, is the huge show in March. Right next to the convention center is the Hyperion Hotel, right? Yeah. And yeah. so there's a not affiliated with Basel. There's a guy that does this thing called Swiss Creative Lab, and our and and he gets a bunch of brands. He basically rents out all the spare conference room space in the hotel. The floors, yeah. The rents first, second, every and floor, yeah. every spare yeah. room they have, every conference room they have available, and then he rents. He like sublets that out to different brands. So like I was right. talking with Monta. I know Monta is going to be there, but then James Henderson. I don't know if he's coordinated with Swiss Creative Labs or if he's just doing this on his own he's got to put together his own little mini show and it's you and nine other brands and it's also yeah. in the Hyperion Hotel and it's called the Hype Show Hype, Hyperion and yeah. 
but it's it's right next to Basel, but it's not part of Basel. And I guess you guys yeah. don't get like signage at Basel, so people kind of have to know when they're visiting Basel, they got to go next door to the Hyperion Hotel, see you guys, see yeah. the guys, from Creative Labs, whatever. But it's yeah, all the, but it's not like it's a big average. They don't they don't advertise a lot. Yeah, they can't really because they they can't really upset the 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 Basel World um, uh, owners. Uh, creators there really so the Basel world owners yeah yeah so um but the hyperion the lobby the bar it's where a lot of people come afterwards or before to eat or to enjoy a drink or to meet people the taxi stops bars. right outside yeah <laughs> so yeah i i, I thought I'd, I'd give it a, a shot and Good. it was fairly, it was quite affordable for well, especially since you live in switzerland yeah how far are you from Basel? I'm uh, an hour's train ride. Oh. So you can sleep in your own bed at night. Exactly. Yeah, I'll That's go great. There and travel back. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So are you thinking maybe you'll go to the Hong Kong show ever or just don't need to, I, don't care? I, I don't know. Um, I'll need to see. You know, I think that a lot of the reasons why people go there, a lot of microbrand owners, is to, you know, manufacturers. Uh, maybe check out some new products. You got to go go to Hong Kong. Yeah, I I just haven't had that issue, um, and you know I I personally don't see myself unless I would ever change to being Swiss made. You know, uh, so you've actually been really fortunate. So the first time I went um, was a, a it was in 2014. I started selling in 2013. So we had been through like two or three production cycles by then. And I went with Sue Jane from Melbourne and Chip from, uh, from AVIG. And, um, you know, we kind of need like to have a, a come to Jesus talk with our factory, you know, find out why are we always getting production delays? Why are the, you know, the, the prototypes never right? You know, we, we toured the fact, the vendors in China, but we were also kind of like letting them know, look, we're here, we're meeting with other vendors. If you guys can't step it up. Up your game, yeah. We're going to fire you and find somebody else. And that's where we all kind of found our next factory. Um, yeah. And, you know, we've kind of gone our separate ways as far as manufacturing goes. But, yeah, but I I didn't just go there to, to find a factory, although I do do that still. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm happy with the one I'm with. But I go to get, like, new ideas to kind of see – what other people are doing, you know, you, yep. sometimes you see your competitors watch in the window of a booth and you go, aha, well, that's his factory. You find a better clasp, a better bracelet supplier, a better dial. You get a sense for, you know, you can shop packaging. So it's just it's yep. good for, for that, but also it's good networking. You know, I've become real good friends with a lot of the other micro brand owners I meet there. And it's like, that's where I meet like Jason from Halios or, you know, like Chip yep. and CJ and I are always there at the same time. Um, but we hang out with like Hong Kong Ed, we've hung out with Tempest Ben, we've hung out with, um, I mean, like I said, last year we had that dinner with like 30 different brand owners. Yeah, so it's really cool. just good for networking. Yep. No, it's, uh, I think it's, it, it would be a great feeling being in the room with, with people who have been in similar journeys uh, yeah. than yourself and, and, and understand it. I mean, it's um, really, like you said at the beginning, I agree with you. It, we all work alone, so it can be a very lonely business. And it's nice sometimes to be able to surround yourself with peers who've all had the same experiences. We've all had production delays, frustrations getting prototypes correct, you know, that problem customer that just won't give up on something. And it's it's nice to kind of feel like normal, you know, with people like, yeah, oh, yeah I've been there. I, I know that guy. We'd actually <laughs> sound like, oh, yeah, no, I sold to that guy. He's out of his mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So we got to wrap this up. Um, this has been great. Do you want to tell us, you know, anything you got coming down the pipeline you want to, you know, sort of tease out? You don't have to if you don't want to. I know you've got enough on your plate already, but what do you, what are you thinking about for the future? You know, do you, do you have a different direction in mind? I, I think my, my aim is to sort of shrink down completely the pre-order weight is to take a bit more risk myself as well and, and, and pay up front. Uh, if it's possible, <laughs> yeah, because uh, this, this business isn't now. cheap. This business isn't cheap. No, it's not. And uh, you know, if 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 I can shrink that time frame and get out watches quicker to to customers, I think they'll be happy, and and I'll be happy as well. 
I think that that's my main focus now is, 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 is to shrink the pre-order time. Um, it just means that when I launch the, the Tura triple calendar and the Tura GMT, it just means that I will have specific set quantities manufactured already yeah. and I can't overfund or oversell. Um, but I think, you know, that, that opens the door if something goes really well to then use that money and invest in, in more models or, you know, to date, I, I have still every old model in stock. Just some of the automatics are, are, are sold out because um, chronograph automatic movements are extremely expensive. I yeah. can't sit on that stock too long. So um, you don't make as many. Yeah, so I don't make Wait, as many. You have so. few people still asking, like, when are you going to make another automatic? Yeah, yeah, a daily. It's impossible. I get that all the time. It is impossible to accurately match, like, supply and demand. There's always a mismatch. Either you have too much or too little. And people yeah. go, like, when are you going to make more? I'm like, I got to make 500 more. If I, I can't make one yeah. more, you know? Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, you know, I, I think when I, I watched your last in the, the last interview you posted with uh, Phil from visitor and he also mentioned that he, he, his aim was not to sell a watch and then move on to the next design. He wanted to build up a staple of, of designs and, and continue to sell them. And I can look back and say that that's what I've done. I've still got my first watch in stock that's selling. I still got the Kerner Curva Chrono in stock that's selling the Synchro. Right. Uh, the Speciale is almost sold out. That is. That's the square you know, one. The, that's the square one. Yeah. That was Real really ex extremely difficult to manufacture. Extremely yeah, difficult really to complex. manufacture. Yeah. And uh, also the the clear coating, the scratch resistant coating. Oh that, yeah, I forgot about that. It's it's if if I can warn other brand owners out there. <clears throat> That application to 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 watches specifically isn't as developed because that technology was used in um, the construction industry. So window handles, window frames, um, you know, they would spray it with this the scratch resistant coating. But it's like nanotech or something, right? It's 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 a clear DLC. Okay. You yeah. know, it's a, it's a clear DLC coating and they are used to these industrial type of um, objects that they coat. Whereas a watch case is small and you can't have any dust, nothing. Right. If the, if the machine that sprays is dirty in any way or form, we had to do those cases probably around three times over really? to get every Got single dust one. In the, the coding? Yeah. To get every single one. And basically you, if, if have you toured if it, the plating, the plating suppliers uh, factory, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have the time to, um, sure? they, I've done it. Yeah. I've been to the plating factory. Well, not the, there's more than one, but I've been to a yeah. plating factory and seen the process. And, um, the one I went to, I mean, it was like state-of-the-art clean room, you know, static resistant floors. You had to go through like a vapor lock to like get into the, the work area. Yeah. It was like completely dust free. They got like air scrubbers going. If they're getting dust, I would, I would want to go there and check out the facility and make sure that but they're this, not subpar. But this is the thing with, with the black DLC coating. It's, it's a different application, I believe. I've, right. I've never had that issue with my black DLC watches. This is a, a, a clear coat. Um, it's, it's literally like spraying a car and, and uh, you know, it, it hasn't been used that much in a watch application. So the machines are used to having these um, industrial uh, like door handles and things like that. So yeah. uh, that is the, w the feedback that, that, that I got. I almost um, wonder if, are you getting like, um, so you're doing a clear coat but I wonder if it's like the same machinery used to do the colored coats. No, I believe it's, it's not. Like the black or the blue residue in the clear. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not. It's, it's just it, air, it, dust? It, it's, it's dust or it wasn't evenly sprayed. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, so basically the, the cases needed to come out. They needed to be blasted again to remove the coating. Oh. And then they need to be polished. 
uh, for the high polished ones and the matte ones sandblasted again and then it needs to go back into the machine so i think around i would say 30 percent of every coating was needed to be redone um maybe it could be down to the supplier it it it, it could it could be um well, so I, I haven't i haven't used the next one like so if i have um, a problem like this i ask my primary vendor and you know, it's basically his job. We lost you there for a second. There you go. There we go. But when I have a problem like this, I ask my primary vendor, my OEM, hey, explain to me what's going on here. How do we fix this? And generally, they do a pretty good job of saying, okay, let me break it down for you. Here's what's happening. And here's how you either live with it, fix it, or yep. avoid it in the future. Have, have they yep. given you any kind of explanation on how this is happening and why and, and you know, how to, what to do about it? They said to me that they would be looking at other... Um, coaters who can do this specific application for watches because their feedback to me initially was that there are not that many um there aren't there aren't factories that, many. that that will do this specific application to watches because yeah. to to them it's high risk because it has to be perfect right so some of these and factories the would, and they have additional cost if it's not right well this is typical chinese manufacturing methods if if it's wrong my manufacturer would have to pay again right not them they wouldn't do it again for free oh wow that that's just typical 90 percent of the way chinese factories work well I don't. that's know. why we i get i get different feedback on my end so we had um we had some issues with the bracelets on our last production and my primary vendor and the bracelet vendor it didn't cost me anything other than, you know, to deal yeah. with it with my customers. But my primary sure. vendor and my bracelet vendor, they split the cost of yep. remaking the links that we needed to replace. Exactly. But that is down to, that again, to that what the face thing. Yeah, that, that basically is what decides a good manufacturer from a bad one. Right. Because you, you hear the horror stories about, um, you know, a, a guy produces, I've heard this, and this is fact. Um, because my manufacturer um, rectified the issue. Uh, a client ordered 20,000 pieces of a $50 cheap dive watch, and they ended up printing the bezels, the numbers inverted, and they finished the complete production of 20,000 watches, delivered it to the USA. Wow. They had to send all 20,000 back and... And the manufacturer that's all your profit yeah they turned their backs and did not want to touch the watches again so this person company got hold of my manufacturer my manufacturer organized 10 workers to go across to hong kong so the goods didn't have to come back to into china right. it's a it's a customs nightmare exactly getting back into china Exactly. And then they sat and they made 20,000 new bezels, removed the bezels and fitted new bezels for 20,000 pieces. It's unbelievable. And you know, th th that is really, it's down to a good manufacturer from the bad one because yep. really there are many factories who will turn their backs on you. They'll deliver a product and you will receive it on your end and you'll say, well, I can't accept this. You know, there's an issue. Well, and I think this goes back to the Kickstarter issue and guys that are starting in this business, not realizing yeah. where all the pitfalls and, and quicksand, you know, traps are. Yeah. And you could be out of business before you even get into business because of something like this. And, I, and I've seen it yeah. happen where, you know, they get an internal bezel wrong. We, we, it almost happened to me on my first model. We used the, uh, the Seagull ST19 chronograph. And you told me, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, the Seagull ST19, it's so reliable. Mm, no, it's not. You have to test, 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 and test again. Test. And, yeah. you know, we had so we had like a 30% defect rate right out of the gate. And then we would have watches come back after they were fixed, and we'd have to send them right back. I lost back the again, ability yeah. to track what our actual defect rate. I had to, like, estimate, and I figured it was about 50%. But at a certain point, Seagull wouldn't even help us anymore. They were like, yeah, whatever, here you go. They don't yeah. care. So it yeah. is about finding the right vendors, but also for guys like you and I to understand, sometimes you're better off not taking somebody's money until you're sure you've got a product in hand and that you're willing to sell it to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So 
this has been fantastic. I think you and I should maybe talk later offline about, you know, how are you going to do this and grow your business? If you're still going to work your full-time job, I got some ideas, but private conversation, but uh, yeah, this has been great. I really want to, uh, hopefully people, um, you know, learn more about you and your brand and uh, this is good for your business. Like I said, I always respected you, but I've, you know, got a new admiration for you. Um, we're going to put your uh, links to your website, Instagram, Facebook page on the uh, description of the video. And then uh, you know, if you want to send us some pictures of the watches we discussed today, the Laguerra, the, uh, the Daily Driver, um, the Tourer, we'll put those up on the video at whatever point we were talking about it. Uh, so people see those and know what we were talking about. Great. Thanks a lot for the opportunity, Chris. And uh, My pleasure. Yeah. It was great talking to you finally. Speak to you soon. Take care, bud. Cheers. Cheers.